As director of the Manasseh Ben Israel Institute, and on behalf of our partner, uh, of our partners, the Joods Historisch Museum and the University of Amsterdam, I would like to welcome you to our third evening in the series "Caught Up in the Clash of Civilizations: Jewish Culture Between East and West." One of the reasons to have a series devoted to this subject was what is for me a puzzling development in recent Jewish history. The fact that Jews nowadays are being associated more and more uh, with the West, for example, through the notion of a Judeo-Christian culture on which Professor Frank van Vree has lectured in this series, while in the past they were perceived as exponents of the East, as Orientals. I thought it would be interesting to investigate um, what had happened to bring about this change. And I decided that actually the easiest way to do so was to simply send an email to someone from whom I wanted to hear the answer the most and invite him to come and give his answer in the form of a lecture. This person was Stephen Aschheim, professor of culture and intellectual history at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. There are many reasons why I wanted to hear his opinion on the matter. First of all, he is a truly great intellectual and cultural historian. Second, he started his career with his by now classic work, Brothers and Strangers, the East European Jew, Jews in German and German Jewish Consciousness, in which the perception of the Jew as Oriental was an important theme, um, as it was an important stereotype of Eastern European Jews. Eastern Jews. Most of all, however, it was his method of understanding culture by, as he once put it, analyzing disputed questions of discourse, which I'd like to see applied to this question. Let me quote in full the way he describes this method himself. By documenting and analyzing the thickness and complexity, the variety of interested inter uh, uh, interpretations implicit in almost all disputed questions of discourse, I have come to see that we not only grasp better the nature of the culture under examination, but also its dynamics, the ways it is constructed, its emphasis, elisions, biases and values, its self-conserving strategies and potentials for change." End of quotation. After Brothers and Strangers, Professor Aschheim applied this method in many other works, analyzing German, German-Jewish, but also Western cultural in general well into the 20th century. He wrote The Nietzsche Legacy in Germany, 1890-1990, uh, another book, Scholem Arendt Klemperer, Intimate Chronicles in Turbulent Times, and his latest book, Beyond the Border, The German-Jewish Legacy Abroad. He also wrote many important articles on Nazism in Western consciousness, on Jewish culture in Weimar, Germany, on Hannah Arendt. I think it is fair to say that he has an important share in Arendt's present popularity, and other subjects, some of which can be read in yet two other books he published by essays called, uh, with essays by his hand called Cultural, Culture and Catastrophe and In Times of Crisis. I was, of course, delighted when Professor Aschheim the same day answered my mail, writing that he was willing to take up the challenge and was willing to come to Amsterdam. Later, I received mails to warn me that I should not expect too much, that the lecture may not exactly answer my questions that it would perhaps be too long, it did not worry me at all. Knowing his work, I am, uh, was and I am convinced that whatever the outcome would be, the lecture would not disappoint. Uh, dear Steve, it is a great honor to ask you to, to come to the stand and hold your lecture, The Modern Jewish Experience and the Entangled Web of Orientalism. That's lovely. I don't think there is any way I can possibly live up to expectations after an introduction like that. Um, 
And obviously, I thank David very much, as well as the, the staff of the Menashe Ben Israel Institute, for the invitation. Uh, my emails were not joking. Uh, I struggled over this. And uh, anybody who thinks that they're going to find answers as a result of this lecture will be sorely disappointed. All I can do is share some of my doubts and some of the problems that I've raised together with you, uh, hopefully in a productive discussion. So let me begin at the beginning uh, with the great uh, Yehuda Halevi's one poem, the quote that everybody knows, to show the problem. My heart is in the East, and I am at the ends of the West, said Yehuda Halevi, 10th, uh, 1085, and he died in 1141. So, politics and the writing of history have always been deeply in interconnected realms. And it's very clear that the great political question of our own time, the clash of civilizations, has highlighted themes and problems of history writing that particularly beforehand were not central or particularly relevant. And that explains perhaps why so much of contemporary post 9-11 scholarship is so intent on studying categories such as Islam, Europe, the Judeo-Christian tradition, what does secular mean, what does religious mean. That is in the field of general history. In the field of Jewish history, what is happening is that it too is increasingly focusing on the critical interplay of East and West as both formative and problematic forces in the Jewish engagement with the modern world. Tonight, I want to try and examine the continuing complex ironies and tensions of this dichotomy between the Oriental and the Occidental. And every time I say Oriental and Occidental, you have to imagine quotes. Uh, I'm talking about the constructions of Oriental and Occidental, and the way in which this East-West division, what role has it played in modern Jewish politics, culture, and identity? Now, the Oriental-Occidental divide is, of course, a general ontological and epistemological cut that runs through Western history. It is a power-driven distinction between Asia and Arabia on the one side, the mysterious, sometimes decayed, voiceless Orient, and the progressive, articulate Occident. This is a paradigm that is inextricably associated with the work of Edward Said, which despite all the critical qualifications, and there are critical qualifications, still has some essential truth to it. And Said points out correctly that this cut, this division, has its origins as far back as antiquity. And this division is a kind of marker of identity. Who am I? Who is the other? And these roots uh, of, of the distinction go back pretty far. Still, apart from present political conflicts, its contemporary sting, the own, our own ways of thinking about East and West must also be related very much to the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment with all its magnificence and all its biases and problems. They go together. So it is against this larger backdrop that much of the modern Jewish experience can be framed. In which way? As one of multiple contradictory negotiations with both the Orientalist and Occidental discourses. These discourses of the East and the West were and continue to be constructed both against the Jews and by them. It's a double moment. They are constructed against and by them. In numerous ways, Jews internalized and deflected these narratives. It defined them. They were self-deprecating and sometimes self-asserting. 
a, an Israeli sociologist, Aziza Kazum, has suggestively labeled this as the great chain of Orientalism, in which westernizing Jewish groups constructed and affirmed their own modern identity by appropriating secular enlightened norms and then creating mirror opposites, negative opposites, foisting oriental stereotypes and characteristics upon other Jewish groups who were supposed to be lower in the line of civilization. So there is much, I think, to be said for this, but I think it doesn't leave enough room for the subtle ways in which the discourse has operated, the ways in which you can undermine or resist or transform these uh, stereotypes. So what I want to talk about really is the idea of an Orientalist web, a kind of all-enveloping thematic in which modern Jewish history, in almost all its permutations, has been entangled. It's still entangled. At the end of the lecture, I will get to the way in which it operates today. Uh, and which has produced any number of ironic and debilitating, but also creative moments. Now, why is this so? Why should this web of the Orient and the Occident be so tight in Jewish history? Well, I think the answer is pretty obvious. You don't need to fly all the way from Jerusalem to Amsterdam to give the answer. It flows almost inevitably from the ambiguous status of the Jews in the Western world. Jews are seen or were seen to inhabit a kind of liminal, hyphenated condition. They are at one and the same time and variably seen as both Occidental and Oriental. Jews are seen as Eastern and as Western. And it is this dialectical tension that I think constitutes part of what I call the Oriental web or the Orientalist web. Let's begin with the age of emancipation. As Western and Central European Jews were allowed to leave their ghettos, they were regarded in, in many ways as local foreigners. That may still be true to this day. That's another question. For local foreigners who were emerging from dark, mysterious, and pre-civilized cultures. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that as French or German Jews sought to enter into society, they were themselves were represented as a kind of internal oriental. Their integration was predicated upon the demand that their alien traditions the exclusive ghetto mentality, their manners undergo radical reform and regeneration in a manner consistent with progressive modern standards and the moral and aesthetic refinements of Bildung. There were many components to this. It wasn't the only component, but it was also informed by a broader Orientalist discourse. Jews, amongst other things, could easily be represented as strangers to Europe, backward, Eastern, and Asiatic. And of course, it is true that the Jewish account of their own origins is not in Prague or in Berlin or even in Amsterdam, but in the Middle East. So the notion that Jews, as they came out of the ghettos, were foreigners, were, if you like, from outside Europe had very, very broad connotations. The anti-Semitic Christian theologian Johann David Michaelis um, basically regarded Jews as an unmixed, degenerate southern race, product of the climate of the ancient Orient, who could never be physically or temperamentally Germanized, and was essentially fitted for work in German-controlled sugar plantations in the West Indies. This is true, too, for much of Christian theology, which tried to break the connection between Oriental mosaic law and Jesus' Christianity. But these attitudes were not just limited to Jew haters. Herder, who in many ways was the champion of the Jews, Herder called Jews the Asiatics of Europe. Voltaire, designated the ancient Jews 
as vagrant Arabs infested with leprosy. And even the champion of Jewish rights, Christian Wilhelm Dom, spoke of Jews as Asiatic refugees. So it seems actually quite clear that as German Jewry, I'm speaking here because I, know, I dare not speak of Dutch Jewry, I know too little about them. Um, as German Jews sought to modernize, become westernized, um, it's quite clear that they in many ways internalized these stereotypes. And in fact, westernization became their self-conscious project and how to overcome their eastern ways. Let's just give two very quick examples. In 1897, writing under a pseudonym, uh, um, you all know the man's name, his name was Walter Rathenau, wrote that his fellow German Jews, his fellow German Jews, not East European Jews, his fellow German Jews with their weak, uncoordinated bodies constitute an Asiatic horde a hopelessly conspicuous foreign organism in the middle of German life. If Germans, if Jews were to become proper Europeans, they had to decisively shed their Asian being and the way of walking, way of walking, way of talking, using their hands. Jakob Frommer was even more radical. He wrote, submerge yourselves, disappear, disappear along with your terrible oriental physiognomy and so on and so forth. But that's obvious. What is more interesting is the way in which the idea of the Orient was redirected, turned into a virtue, transformed, and became a marker not of Jewish inferiority, but of pride, even superiority. The most obvious example of this, so I won't talk about it, is Benjamin Disraeli, as you all know who turned this being a, uh, if you like, oriental Jew into a supreme kind of virtue. This also, and this I must stress, Jewish history doesn't live in the ghetto in the modern period. It is only comprehensible in terms of its relationship with broader European history. This idea of making the Orient superior also followed a more general European romantic fashion of the time. It also reproduces the East-West distinction. That remains this kind of binary distinction between East and West, but now the, the East is idealized, made exotic. So for instance, uh, the idea of the Orient wasn't necessarily a negative term. This was the proud name of an elite 19th century German Jewish liberal journal devoted to the scientific study of Jewish tradition and its Middle Eastern roots. By making the Orient into some kind of superior background, Jewish scientists or Jewish scholars provided the tools to uncover a respectable and usable past. In other words, you use the Orient as a way of, number one, uh, uh, disputing Christian and also anti-Jewish narratives. This was a tool. In fact, the emergent bourgeoisie, which was seeking models for its own respectability, turned to what they presented as the very superior legacy of rationalist Sephardic Jewry. Do I need to tell people living in Amsterdam about this? I rather think not but David asked me to prepare a formal lecture, so here we go. The golden age of Moorish Spain. To turn to the golden age of Spain was to do two things. It was the Jewish scholars who were revolting both against Orthodox Judaism and against anti-Semitic narratives. So the idea of the golden age of Spain could serve as a model in numerous fields, Jewish liturgy, synagogue architecture, literature, philosophy, scholarship. All of these fitted purpose beautifully into the ideal of an enlightened emancipation. German enlightened culture turned to Greece and Rome. So what the Jews could do is they found their own enlightenment in the Spanish Moorish period. This was their classicism. 
After all, was not Maimonides the great exemplar of secular knowledge? And in many ways, the exemplification of what German Jewry sought to be. These medieval Jews from Arab Muslim society, Edward Guns pointed out, Muslim Jews were marked, I quote, by morality, purer speech, greater order in the synagogue, and in fact, better taste. So there was nothing negatively oriental about Spain's Arabs and Jews. I'm sure Mark Cohen probably spoke about that too. On the contrary, Spain's Jews and Arabs were remarkably presented as the guarantors of Western rational culture. Boy, have the tables turned. As the great scholar, a Prussian expatriate writing from Paris, Solomon Munk, put it, Jews unquestionably share with Arabs the distinction of having preserved and disseminated the science of philosophy during the centuries of barbarism and thereby having exercised on Europe a civilizing influence. By the way, I don't know if you know the work of Leo Strauss, but if you know this tradition, it's not a great surprise that Leo Strauss has discovered the Arab Jewish rationalism as a way of critiquing modern Western civilization. That's just in brackets. I have not disappeared, I'm just taking water. You probably thought I hadn't prepared the rest of the lecture. Um, you will have heard of Heinrich Heine, who, took, who said the following in 1854. In Northern Europe and in America, especially in the Scandinavian countries, among the Germanic peoples, the Palestinian way of life has prevailed. The genuine, the ageless, the true, the morality of ancient Judaism will bloom just as it did in the heights of Lebanon. And then he used, he took the Oriental-Occidental dichotomy, but turned it on its head. Judea, he wrote, has always seemed to me to be a fragment of the West, which has got lost in the East. It's a strange way of dealing with, but he keeps the distinction. So Judea actually begins in the West, it gets lost in the East. His great admirer, a man called Friedrich Nietzsche, used the same kind of East-West metaphor but he was even more radical in the way in which he transformed it. He made Jews as quintessential Europeans and Christians as Asians. Jews, I quote, not only have the most grief-laden history of any people, but have produced the noblest human being, Christ, the purest sage, you'll be glad to hear who he is, Spinoza, and the most efficient moral efficacious moral code in the world. In the darkest period of the Middle Ages, when the cloud of Asia had settled over Europe, it was Jewish free thinkers, physicians, who under the harshest conditions held firmly to the banner of enlightenment and defended Europe against Asia. Now listen to this quote. You know, sometimes you find quotes for lectures which you think, my goodness, the man wrote it because he knew I was going to give the lecture. He says, if Christianity has done everything to orientalize the Occident, Judaism has always played an essential part in occidentalizing it again. In his view, Judaism is Occidental, Christianity is Oriental. A perfect inversion. But we must return to Jewish appropriations. It's been well established by scholars, I won't go into now, that the Wissenschaft des Judentums, the science of Judaism, had a far more sympathetic view of the Orient than Edward Said's presentation of what the West says it had. In fact, at times, it wasn't only sympathetic or close identity, it wasn't a symp uh, just sympathy, but very close identification which applied. The rather eccentric Hungarian Semitic scholar Ignaz Goltzia, who died in 1921, wrote of his 1890 stay in Damascus. 
I truly entered in those weeks in the spirit of Islam to an extent that ultimately I became inwardly convinced that I myself was Muslim and judiciously discovered that this was the only religion which even in its doctrinal and official formulation can satisfy philosophical demands. Actually, Goldsier was very interesting. He worked for a Jewish community, but he was extremely critical, so he used Islam as a way of critiquing Judaism. Goldsier did not convert, but there are some highly colorful, even if they are not re representative characters in modern Jewish history, who did convert to Islam and literally orientalized themselves. Perhaps the first... I wanted to give the whole lecture on these people, but my wife said, no, you can't do that, too much gossip. Perhaps the first of these was the prolific Hungarian-born, Catholic-educated Orientalist, Hermann Bamberger, or Armin Vamberi, alias Rashid Effendi, who was intrigued by the Ottoman Empire, became a full Osmanli, published, amongst various other things, a Turkish-German dictionary in 1858, and disguised as a Sunnite dervish, was the first West European to travel the entirety of Central Asia from the Black Sea to Constantinople. Bamberger converted to Islam in Turkey. True, this guy was definitely an interesting guy. He later converted to Protestantism, an opportunist move enabling him to enter the Catholic University of Budapest in 1865. And he is remembered as a double dealer and double agent. He was employed as a spy by the British to combat Russian attempts at gaining ground in Central Asia. He even dabbled in Zionism, promising but not delivering in return for payment to arrange a meeting for Theodor Herzl with the Sultan. If you look at his letterhead, it has both the Islamic crescent and the Jewish Star of David combined. Yet another such figure was Kurbin Said, the author of the best-selling novel Ali and Nino, an enchanting love story about a Muslim boy and Christian girl set in the tolerant old world of Azerbaijan. He went by the name of Asad Bey, and actually was the mysterious adventure, adventurer and ultimately tragic figure of Lev Nussenbaum, a Jew born in Baku in, 19, in 1905 and who died in 1942. Amongst other things, he was the biographer of the Russian Tsar and Stalin, a Weimar media star, a prominent Hollywood figure in the 30s, and a shadowy figure who courted Mussolini. He converted to Islam in 1922, which had attracted him from childhood. He did come from the East, Baku, and which, in addition to his desert romanticism, he regarded as the most inclusive of all religions. He presented himself as a Muslim prince, and in one of the most delectable ironies of the Orientalist saga, he wrote his Middle East work called Allah is Great, The Decline and Rise of the Islamic World, together with Wolfgang Weisel, who was a militant right-wing Zionist and a close associate of the revisionist leader Vladimir Jabotinsky. I'll speak about him in a minute. Our next figure to have even dreamed of writing with a Zionist would have been absolutely unacceptable and unthinkable. And I'm talking about the Galician-born scion of a long line of rabbis, a man called Leopold Weiss, 1900 to 1922. He was the young Middle East correspondent for the Frankfurter Zeitung, who wrote in 1923, Zionism has bound itself irrevocably to outside Western powers, and as such is a wound in the body of the Near East. After that, he traveled throughout the Middle East, became entranced with and converted to Islam, which he called a perfect work of architecture, and then changed his name to Muhammad Assad. He was a great supporter of national liberation movements and especially Pakistani independence. And indeed, he became the country's first ambassador to the United Nations and drafted the preamble to the Pakistani constitution. His translation into English of the Quran has been highly acclaimed. 
He always pleaded for rationality and plurality in Muslim law. This he regarded as the real legacy of its founders and towards the end of his life became disillusioned by the emerging fundamentalism and fanaticism of fellow Muslims and moved to Spain where he died in relative obscurity. It's actually not accidental that all these Jewish converts to Islam presented liberal interpretations of that faith for, for quite obvious reasons. Now it's our last exotic figure who I think will be of particular interest to the present audience, the Dutch-born Yaakov Israel de Haan, who was instrumental in obtaining Mohammed Assad or Leopold Weiss's journalistic assignment to the Middle East. So de Haan has something to do with Pakistan's constitution. The flamboyant de Haan did not convert to Islam but he certainly can be considered as a kind of radically idiosyncratic orientalist. Born in Smilda, is that how you say it? In 1881, raised in an Orthodox Jewish home, he was a journalist, legal scholar, school teacher, social democrat, and author of some scandalous homoerotic novels which rendered him notorious and virtually unemployable. That may be why he turned to Zionism and in 1919 became the first Netherlands Jew, I believe, to immigrate to Eretz Israel. Very soon he became disillusioned with Zionism and its treatment of Orthodox Jews and Arabs, joined the virulently anti-Zionist ultra-Orthodox Agudat Israel, and sought a legal base, basis for Jewish communal existence under Arab Jewish jurisdiction. All his criticisms, I'm sure you know the story, rendered him to be the first victim of Zionist political assassination in 1924. And of course, in those pre-enlightened, pre-gay days, the fact that he had written these highly suggestive homosexual poems made him an even easier target. Now, the, why have I spent so much time, I think they're all interesting, on these, they are very marginal figures. They're not representative figures. I think also, however, they do express a certain openness and fluidity of identity which in our much more hardened ideological times I think becomes far more problematic. But now let me turn to a more central chapter of Jewish Orientalism. This also sprang out of more general tendencies but took on its own particular Jewish turn. We have seen that Western Jewry romanticized Spain's Moorish Golden Age, but that was taken from the distant past. Jews who lived in contemporary Islamic societies, be it in Algeria, be it in Morocco, were dismissed as relatively primitive, products of a decayed and stagnant, stagnating civilization. Under the aegis of colonialism, Western and especially French Jews would employ the universal principles of emancipation to undertake what they themselves had previously undergone, regeneration. As the disparity of power between Europe and the Islamic world grew greater, emancipated Western Jewry began to regard what they previously saw as venerated Sephardi Jews of Africa and Asia now they didn't stress their Spanish heritage, but stressed that they were Orientals, victims of unenlightened, oppressive societies. And the role of Jews would be to lift them off their bootstraps. And this, of course, is the work of the Alliance Israel Universale. Um, what is interesting about it, though, it wasn't just colonial. It was both patronizing, but it also included a sense of responsibility for, the, for their fellow Jews. But Asia and Africa at this time, I'm talking about the end of the 19th century, were still very much on the periphery. Much more important was what was happening within Europe itself, especially um, with their traditional unemancipated Jews of Eastern Europe. Now, we should not forget that the Enlightenment map of civilization divided the world into, if you like, Arabia and the civilized Occident, but also had a very specific view, how do we divide Europe? 
Europe is divided between the backward Eastern and the progressive Western components. I don't think that's entirely dead to this day. In fact, I think it's still with us. This was a relatively new disjunction because you should remember during the Renaissance, the, the distinction in Europe was not east-west, but was north-south. But in the second half of the 18th century, Western Europe essentially invented Eastern Europe as its mirror negative image. The French Enlightenment often labeled Eastern Europe as the Orient of Europe, where the other was configured as dark, backward, the symbolic opposite necessary for the identity and the self-conception of a more powerful, progressive, civilized West. And this is true, too, for the Jews. As Jewish Germanization or Westernization proceeded, more and more pre-emancipated Polish ghetto Jewry became the convenient foil upon which they could displace what previously had been their own negative Eastern characteristics. It also became a way in which you could deflect anti-Semitic sentiments. That is to say, we are modern and progressive. The Jews who are pre-civilized, who are ghetto Jews, they are causing the anti-Semitism. And with the passing of time, the very definition of being a German or French Jew depended upon this distinction between backward and ignorant East European Asian forms of Judaism and Western forms of Judaism. This clearly is part of the chain of Orientalism, where you have done it and now you deflect or you project it upon a lower group. But this doesn't really capture what I've called the complex web and even its ironic character. For while Western and Central European Enlightenment uh, uh, Orientalism labeled Eastern Europe as a cradle of barbarism, barbarism, there was always the sense of ongoing, even if it was patronizing, responsibility for their Eastern Jewish cousins. Western Jews would assume the task of civilizing their brethren and taking them out of their misery on the basis of their Bildung and enlightenment. Now, it is true that this is part of Orientalism, is to view other cultures through the superior prism of your own culture, through the superior spectacle of your own culture. But this is much more complicated, because if there was dissociation and embarrassment on the one hand, there was also a nagging sense of solidarity, responsibility, and identification, even nostalgia on the other hand. This is absent from the usual Orientalist paradigm. Just let's for a minute take the, the work of somebody who made the stereotype famous, not as a philosophical or academic exercise, but in his novels. He's forgotten today. I'm talking about somebody who's called Karl Emile Franzos, the person who most articulated this stereotype of the Ostjuda, the East European Jew. On the one hand, it was clearly patronizing and colonialism. Jews, like other peoples in Galicia and elsewhere, were products of what he called Halp Asian, half Asia. And what is half Asia? Half Asia is a strange amalgam of Europe with Asian barbarism. His Jews lived unmistakably narrow, repressed, and dirty lives. His writings clearly reflected the Enlightenment distaste for ghetto life. All of this clearly uh, fitted into a classical Orientalist mindset and a specifically Jewish commitment. At the same time, I mean, basically, he's the person who says, it's a famous expression, Den jedes Land hat die Juden, die es verdient. Every land gets the, every country gets the Jews it deserves, which is doubly critical in the way, in, obviously it's not saying something particularly nice about the Jews, but it's saying something very critical about the culture that allows this uh, to occur. But with all of this, you will see that François himself is ambivalent, and he's ambivalent because he himself is not comfortably in the middle of the German and the Jewish, the Western and the Eastern. 
he's always kind of locked into uh, this kind of, of issue. Um, what I want to basically say is Jewish Orientalism differs slightly from others because Jewish Orientalism always said in a deep way the Jews we are Orientalizing are our own stock, belong to us. So it isn't as if the West is looking at totally different groups. It is, has to do with your own group dynamics. Francois says we are saving our unfortunate brothers in faith. And basically, part of this whole relationship has to do with one observer who claimed for West, Western Jews, Eastern Jews were simply the images of our own fathers. And as you know, relationships to fathers are usually a combination of both love and resentment. And it fits this beautifully. But of course, for some dissenting sections of Central European Jewry at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th, there was a counter movement in which East European Jewry and the category of the Oriental merge into some kind of radical in, uh, uh, affirmation. This is at the same time as Western culture in general sought inspiration in the mystic, the mythical, in the occult, in the warm wisdom of Eastern religions, lost in the bourgeois, over-rationalized soul of the West. The cult of the Ostjuden, as I called it, involved mainly second-generation Zionists, but also some pretty famous other people, including Gustav Landauer, Franz Rosenzweig, and very critically, a man called Franz Kafka. Now, these people were portrayed as the embodiment of authenticity, of community, of spirituality. They were the genuine Jews. Eastern Jewish life in the ghetto was held now to be whole and organic. And this has to do, basically, with the fact that people were now saying, these are not separate from you, they share the same inherited characteristics. Martin Buber is important in this uh, direction, not just because he popularized Hasidism and turned the stereotype on its head before it represented the worst in the ghetto, now it's the very example of spirituality, but because he combined rediscovering the Hasidism with what he called, I am revealing anew the limitless power of Oriental man an exemplar of Asiatic strength and Asiatic inwardness. In fact, he made the whole of Judaism, not just Hasidism, as emerging out of the, I quote, the spirit of the Orient, the supreme sublimation of the Oriental's motor character, the pathos of a divine command, attained its greatest intensity in Judaism. The Jew, Bube insisted, had been driven out of his land and dispersed throughout the Occident. I quote, yet in all this, he has remained an Oriental. And the Oriental Jew was a priceless gift that the Jews were giving to a mechanized, soulless Europe. And it's very interesting to note, it was at least to me, that in the face of Weimar in anti-Semitism, an increasingly anti-Semitic Germany, this rhetoric became very crucial for people who not only were not involved in Zionism, but had nothing to do with the Jewish community. Suddenly, they discovered that they were Oriental. Thus, famous, rather perplexed writers, such as Jakob Wassermann and Leon Feuchtwanger, loudly proclaimed the virtues of Orientalism and their own identity as embodying Oriental wisdom. And this was clearly a self-mythologizing self-definition a consolatory source of identity in a society that increasingly rejected them, and which in turn they could now say, this is our unique contribution to you, or even our superiority over you. But of course, the paradox of all these Orientalisms, and they exist kind of wherever you look, you find them, consists in the fact that they were all essentially European counter-myths, ideas conceived within a European context 
and in European categories and not seriously meant to de-Europeanize and orientalize oneself. Now we get to the difficult part of the lecture. We have to turn our attention now to where the issues remain contemporary, urgently so, at the fault line of international geopolitics and root existential dilemmas. For it is clearly with the ideology of pract and practice of Zionism and the state of Israel that the problematic threads of Orientalism and Occidentalism were and continue to be most thickly, dangerously, and dialectically entangled. We should begin by saying that from the beginning, Zionism's relationship to both Europe and the Orient was dense and deeply ambivalent. Zionism, after all, is inconceivable outside of European history. It is not only a reaction to that continent's outbursts of anti-Semitism, but its very model of nationalism, its related ideals and categories, all come from Europe. It incorporates both the negation and the emulation of the European experience. It represented the simultaneous desire to leave its shores and yet, in many ways, to recreate and perpetuate Europe. Political Zionism's founding father, Theodor Herzl, embodied these tensions. Jews, he believed, had to be rescued from the potential of a murderous European anti-Semitism. Yet his vision of national, they would have to leave Europe. Yet his vision of national liberation had very little traditionally Jewish or Oriental about it. His new society was to be an improved, liberal, scientific, and technological version of Europe, not a negation. German, not Hebrew, was to be the privileged future language, and society was to be organized not along clerical or feudal lines, but as a blend of progressive capitalist and collective principles. And, additionally, the perception of Israel as a kind of colonial Western outpost has its beginnings partly from this vision and the fact that Herzl, given the time that he lived in, made politics with the imperial powers. It was precisely this resentment of Herzl's Europeanism that created one of the first distinctions in Zionism between Ostjuden und Westjuden, Eastern Jews and Western Jews. The leading Euro East European Zionist, Achada Am, said the following, you're so permeated with the standards of foreign culture that in the end the Jewish state will be a state of Germans or Frenchmen of the Jewish race. And in his reply, unabashed, at that time Eurocentricism was not a bad thing, Max Nordau replied, Alt Neuland, Old Neuland, is a piece of Europe in Asia. Achad Am, he said, might see European culture as foreign, but we will make it accessible to him. The future Jewish state will be a liberal one, part of the culture of Western and Central Europe, not derived, I quote, from an anti-cultural wild asientum, as Achad Am desires. If Western Zionism sought to unite all Jews in a single nation, it also replicated the Oriental distinction. Franz Oppenheim, Oppenheim, an early Zionist, said this, we, the German Jews, cannot be Jewish by culture, because the Jewish culture, as it's been preserved from the Middle Ages in the ghettos of the East, stands infinitely lower than modern culture, which our Western nations bear. We can neither regress, nor do we want to. Eastern Jews, however, must be Jews by culture, for the medieval Jewish culture stands as far above East European barbarism as it is beneath the culture of Western Europe. So again, you have, you have uh, th this funny thing that Jews should keep their culture because their culture is higher than the lower culture of Eastern Europe. One of the great, and this is where David comes in, one of the great ironies of this entangled story is the fact that it was these very East European Jews 
this wild Asientum, who constituted the driving force in the creation of a new state, the state of Israel, with Western secular norms and institutions. One observer has put it caustically, how did the Asians of Europe become the Europeans of Asia? This, of course, emerges quite naturally from the, the fact that Zionism was essentially a modernizing national movement. But from the perspective of the Orientalist paradigm, Ostjuden, who are no longer called Ostjuden, but are obviously called by their older name, Ashkenazim, now presented themselves and were perceived as quintessential Europeans or West Europeans. It is these Ashkenazim who were the founding fathers, institution builders, and tone setters of the new society. Although this is increasingly changing, their domination remains intact. As a result of this, many of the negative backward characteristics that were applied to these same Eastern European Jews were now directed at the Jewish masses from Arab countries, who after 1948 poured into the new state. And of course, it wasn't difficult to ascribe Oriental characteristics to these people because these were Jews who did come from Oriental or Arab and Muslim societies and already a stereotype existed uh, for how they should be deal dealt with. No less a man than Abba Evin, who I assume people know of, wrote, our object should be to infuse the Svaradim with an Occidental spirit, rather than allow them to drag us into an unnatural Orientalism. End of quote. There is even now in Israel a growing radical literature which argues that these Svaradim constitute the Jewish victims of Zionism. Their patronizing resettlement at the periphery, the cutting off of earlocks, the humiliating treatment as possibly infectious creatures, including DDT lousing, delousing, remains a scar in the popular memory. But again, Jewish Orientalism is thicker than this, basically because it is not based purely upon identity distance. These Jews were held to be backward, but they were still considered to have the same roots and heritage, and above all, slated to become part of the nation, integrated into the Jewish collectivity. So this was a politics both of belonging and of difference. And so, if you like, while Oriental Jews were regularly regarded as a rather backward non-European other, a Levantinizing threat, for different purposes, they were also portrayed as the ancient, authentic Jews, primordial embodiments of a long historical tradition, still exemplifying colorful folkways and folklore. But most critically, if Jews from Arab countries were regarded with patronizing Orientalist eyes, it was also deemed necessary, given the Israel-Arab conflict, to radically de-Arabize the Arab Jews. To decisively mark the gulf, the ontological differences between Jews from Oriental countries and the Arabs. Zionism, oh, let's put it this way. These uh, Jews ultimately became caught between promises of inclusion and practices of exclusion between the Zionist West and the Arab East. Now, there's no doubt, I was talking about 1948, in all kinds of ways, what are called Mizrahim, in, in Hebrew, that means Eastern, Orientals are far more integrated today in Israeli society than they were 20 or 30 years ago. Mizrahi music, which before was a virtually underground phenomenon, has deeply penetrated Israeli popular culture. Nobody today asks, what are the ethnic origins of one of Israel's top writers, Aleph Bet Yoshua? Yet despite all these integrative tendencies, a certain in-betweenness remains. <clears throat> 
the Orthodox Shas party, a party that explicitly purports to represent traditional and underprivileged Mizrahim, is determinedly neither Arab nor Ashkenazi. Still, if certain tensions and resentments against Ashkenazim remain, for them the most important distinction remains that from distinguishing themselves from the Arabs. And I should mention in the spirit of the deflective chain of Orientalism, it should come as no surprise that it is this sector that explicitly voices the most anti-Arab political attitudes in the country. In fact, this isn't part of the lecture, but the minister, interior minister, Eli Yishai, deflected it even further when he described foreign workers in absolutely oriental terms. These migrants bring with them, he wrote, a profusion of diseases, hepatitis, measles, tuberculosis, AIDS, drug addiction, and so on and so forth. But these eventually and rapidly are becoming part of Israeli society. What can be said about the native population, the Arabs of Palestine? Perhaps surprisingly, significant aspects of early Zionism were negatively Occidentalist in the sense that they were critiques of the West and that their image of Arab society was based upon an idealization of the Arabs and a radical rejection of Europe as decadent, exhausted, materialist, and alienated. Sounds pretty much like descriptions we hear today about Europe. Of course, these schemes simply inverted, but they retained the East-West distinction. Mainly a pre-World War phenomenon, prior to the Jew when the Jewish presence in Palestine had become big, and when the Arab-Israel conflict had settled into a remarkably insoluble kind of problem, a kind of Zionist pan-Semitic message emerged about this. Let me just give you one example. A man you probably have not heard of, Eugen Herflisch, radically rejected the Zionist colonial attempt to recreate our Europe in Palestine. He described Zionism as the attempt to create a foreign body or a homeland for de-orientalized Orientals. That's an interesting one. And he proposed a kind of geographical and brotherly, spiritual, anarchical union of Asian cultures, Judaism, Arabia, India, China, and Japan. Obviously, um, it, it's, it's quite clear that this wasn't going to, to work out. But it's, he was not so exceptional as one would think. As late as 1923, a key establishment figure, Arta Rupin spoke of the, the emerging Jewish commonwealth as destined to become an integral part of the modern flowering of a greater Arab civilization on the basis of a common Semitic bond. I quote, we must place ourselves again in the oriental circle of peoples and together with our racial brothers, the Arabs and Armenians, create a new cultural community of the Near East. More than ever, he wrote, it seems to me that Zionism can be justified only in terms of the racial belonging of the Jews to the peoples of the Near Orient. This is not a racism of superiority or difference, but a racism of equality and similarity. So again, it's another twist. There are some strange variations of this. Thus, if you remember the militant right-wing Zionist, Wolfgang Weisel, that I mentioned before, he was a fellow who wandered in the desert in Muslim dress, who was dubbed the Jewish Lawrence of Arabia. He recognized the upcoming force and vitality of the Muslim world, the decline of Europe, and urged for a community of interests dreaming early on of converting the Arabs to Zionism. Now, I'm almost finished. It's a long lecture, but I'm almost there. This was the period where it was not uncommon to see young Zionists walking around in Arab costume and kafir. But this alleged appropriation of nativeness also had a problematic side. For rather than union with the autochthonous population, 
This also was a kind of claim to indigenousness, leaving little voice for the Arabs themselves or their contemporary reality. Indeed, key Zionist leaders, Yitzhak Ben Tzvi, David Ben Gurion, Ber Borochov, insisted that the native Felachin of Palestine were not of Arab origin, but derived from the original agricultural inhabitants, and thus proved the Jewish claim to the land. Obviously, there were people um, who resisted uh, this and said, fundamentally, Zionism, if it has anything to do with the East and West, as people who come from Europe to the East should act as mediators. Whatever the case, what I'm arguing here is that in multi-directional ways, the conflicting meanings of East and West get tied up all through the history. Just let me give you one quote here of the paradox of this. I'm sure most of you have heard of Gershom Scholem. Gershom Scholem writes about his frustration with this entanglement in 1916 in his diary. It seems to be a paradox that I, a complete and untransformed enemy of Europe and a devotee of the new Orient who wants to be the bearer of a new Judah must be content with making the move precisely as the teacher of European knowledge. Two go together uh, all the time. The dilemmas and ironies remain with us to this day. They are thoroughly entangled in what I call the unresolvable Occidental-Oriental myths and realities. Situated in the heart of the Middle East, Israel today stands at the very epicenter of the putative clash of civilizations. For some, it represents the embodiment, the most conspicuous outpost of the colonizing West in the oppressed and resentful East. For others, it stands as a beacon of democratic light in a dark sea of semi-feudal authoritarian regimes. These dichotomies have become even more stark given the, what seems to be the intractable Israel-Palestine -Palest conflict and the wider confrontation on the one hand between the Arab Muslim world and what is now called the Judeo-Christian West. I don't want to talk about that concept, but the Judeo-Christian West is relatively new ideology meant to separate the West from the East again. But that's not the topic here. There is an issue. In which way could Zionism ultimately include in their vision of redemption alien Arabs? Because in many ways the Zionist self-image developed in contrast to it. But I don't think that is the result of an or inherent Orientalism, but the fact that here one ethnic nationalism is tied in a conflict with another ethnic nationalism. But clearly at a time of deepening east-west conflict and the bitter continuation of Palestine-Israel hostilities, Orientalist stereotypes reinforce the Gulf in order to portray Arabs and Jews as implacable enemies essentialist symbols of the East and the West. Page, a page and a half to go. I am a historian, not a politician and not a moralist. So my task has been to map some of the complex ways in which the Oriental-Occidental axis has been deployed, resisted, and negotiated, rather than attempt to provide solutions to the problems that it gives rise. But clearly what, I need, what needs to be said is the degree to which this shapes questions and positions that have taken center stage both within the International Academy and Israel itself. It's a debate that reflects tensions of the wider Zionist inheritance and it's tied to fundamental dilemmas regarding the identity and the self-understanding of the State of Israel itself. Some young radical wrote the following. Many of us still dream, as Theodore Herzl did in his time, of a petit bourgeois central European colony that just happens to be located in the Levant. Since Orientalism is a tool for defining identities, it enables us to imagine ourselves as part of the Western democratic enlightened world, which is locked in constant and irresolvable confrontation 
with the Eastern Islamic and primitive world and thereby entrenches itself and justifies the surrounding of Israel with walls that isolate and separate it from its surroundings. Many of these assumptions are now coming under examination and question. I think Mark Cohen was here a week or two ago, so I, I, I won't go into it, but suddenly, just as there was at the end of the 19th century, there is a new discovery of the golden age of Spain, that there were indeed times where Jews and Muslims not only acted together in concert, but also were vital contributors to their civilizations. There's even been a recent attempt by a man called Gilani Ja to reread the entirety of European history as structured by the relationship to both Arab and Jew in which the, the construction of its enemies, the Jew as theological enemy and the Arab as political enemy, becomes the very marrow of Europe's self-definition. Europe is the site in which the two figures, Arab and Jew, emerge as enemies of the continent, but also of each other. And there's no doubt, too, that as the conflict gets worse on the other side, we have the development of the Western judeo tradition tradition as well. I'm not going to go into the Israeli re-questioning, but let me end with these last words. The, the very borders, cultural as well as geographical, the political directions, indeed the root self-definition of Israeli society, as variously and sometimes exclusively Jewish, a state of all its citizens, as multicultural, an integral part of the Middle East, a Western liberal democracy, these remain still in deep contestation. The stakes are enormous, and no quick, quick or simple resolution is in sight, nor are there answers to this, David. What is clear, however, is that the entanglement within this web is as powerful as ever, and regardless of the attempts to undermine, bridge, or reinforce the dichotomy, it remains at the contested heart of our own modern Jewish experience, and I would say sadly too, at the storm center of world political conflict. Thank you. That was too long. <laughs> too long. You can stay here to answer questions. Right. Thank you very much. I don't really do it too long. <laughs> it's not working. No, you speak here. Hi. Yeah, now it works. Thank you very much. I don't think it was too long enough at all. I only uh, wonder how a lecture of you would be of which you do not think in advance that it has been a struggle to write it. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Um, there's time for some questions. I see there are a lot of questions. Thank you very much for this uh, magnificent lecture. Uh, I have two things. Uh, when I first came to Amsterdam almost 60 years ago, I was told that the Dutch are often called the Chinese of Europe and that the Chinese are called the Jews of Asia. Well, try to figure out where that leads us to. <laughs> the other thing is I wanted to ask you if you're familiar with the investigations of Tzvi Misinai, who is an, an Israeli industrialist who abandoned his, his uh, um, factory for software for his hobby, where he has done investigation, genetic, anthropological, historical, of the non-Jewish population of Israel and around Israel. And he has concluded that about 90% of the non-Jews, the, the Bedouins, the Arabs, are in fact of Jewish descent who, who had decided to stay uh, who, under pressure from the Romans at first, uh, abandoned their Judaism uh, in explicitly, uh, 
and under pressure from the Muslims, uh, converted, uh, but that the, their Jewish background was until it became too dangerous to do so until 20 or 30 years ago, freely discussed and spoken of uh, among certain Bedouin uh, tribes. I, I, I've heard vaguely about this. I, I, I haven't read him and I haven't read in detail. Um, this, it may even be true, but in the same way that I'm suspicious of Arthur Rupin basing his ideas on some kind of racial similarity, I'm also skeptical about any, any kind of race argument, even though these may be liberal ones. There is such a thing in Rupin as liberal racism. It sounds like a, a paradox. So it's interesting, but I'm not sure what flows from that. I'm not sure that these Bedouin today would acknowledge their deep Jewish loyalties. Um, but I don't know. So it's interesting, but how relevant it is politically is another question. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for the lecture. Um, first thing, no, let me put it this way. The Russian Jews who came to Israel um, around the time of Menachem Begin um, and who were his power base, um, they had the choice of going to Israel or often to, to the United States. Now, was in their own experience this move to go to Israel a matter of going from the east to the west, whereas they were received maybe by Israel, Jews uh, coming from the east and staying eastern, uh, even though they themselves might have considered going to the west. You, you've raised something I should have thought about, I haven't thought about, but it's very interesting. Actually here, we're talking about the, you know, about late 20th century, early 21st century. So things have changed. The ironic thing about the Russian Jews who came to Israel is that they look at Israeli culture as Eastern and that their culture is far more civilized, artistic, culturally uh, refined and so on. So there's another of these kind of ironies. I, there has not been the same kind of relationship between the Israeli center and the Russian immigrants as there were with Jews from Arab countries. And first of all, it's a much later period. And there is, without doubt, first of all, Russian Jews have remarkably contributed to Israeli m musical, theatrical, and other culture. Um, but I think there is a kind of climate amongst Russian Jews where they say basically we want to keep our Russian culture because it's a step above the Israeli culture. So I don't think there's a sense of inferiority or Easternness about it. I may be wrong. This is just an impression. Thank you for this brilliant and dense lecture. So full of ideas and insights, it was amazing. Um, just a little point that you made, you said that the East-West Division came about in the late 18th century, and in Dutch Jewish history, there's always been a talk in the 17th century of the distinction between the new arrivals in the mid-17th century from Eastern Europe and the Sephardim who came at the beginning of the century. Maybe that wasn't an East-West discourse, but uh, it's, it's talked about that that way these days. What, what do you think of it? Well, um, you know, dating is always, I don't mean taking out a, a woman. When I said dating, I mean periodizing in history. Uh, it's difficult, but when I talked about the 18th century, I was talking not necessarily about Jews, I was talking about the Enlightenment as such inventing Eastern Europe. So when it comes, let's say, to Dutch Jewish history and the, the, the relationship of Sfaradim to others coming in, that could have been an earlier distinction. I, I was referring to the wider distinction, which applies to this day. Um, if you watch the European Union's crises, I think the East-West distinction still applies. I, I, you may be right about that. I don't want to be dogmatic about the 17th or the 18th century. But the point I was making referred literally to what the Enlightenment was doing. 
Yeah. Um, <coughs> I'd like to ask, uh, uh, what do you think about the um, conspiracy of silence, a very well-known article by Professor Yudha Shenhav of Tel Aviv <laughs> in 96, uh, in which he tries to apply Edward Said's theory about Orientalism as a justification of imperialism against the, uh, the Eastern pe people of the Middle East. Uh, and uh, you, uh, Edward Said stresses, uh, referring to Freud, <coughs> uh, Moses, the, uh, uh, that the Jews must uh, be aware of the real origin, which is Egypt. So they are ori Orient. But uh, in Conspiracy of Silence, uh, Yudash and Hav uh, says that <coughs> uh, the Zionists uh, from the West <coughs> have invented uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, term of there is no, of denying the, uh, the, uh, the factor ethnicity in the Jewish people. It doesn't exist. They invented it in order to, to push the Arabs on the other, not the other, other, other side of the fence, but the Oriental Jews, the Arab Jews, uh, well, he refers to Arab Jews while uh, uh, Bernard Lewis refers to Jews of Islam. And he says, but you can't uh, put the Jews of uh, Arab lands behind the fence. So the, uh, there is no ethnicity. What do you think of it as a factor in, Jew in, in Israeli society? Um, I was very kind tonight. I didn't read the whole lecture. And it's even kinder, I didn't read the footnotes, because we would be here for two days. Um, Yehuda Shenhav, I, he has a book called The Arab Jews. I, part, yeah, which I, 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 parts of what I said tonight were taken from Yehuda Shenhav. In the written paper, it's acknowledged and footnoted, because um, if I mention names here, it doesn't really ring a bell. And I think there is a great deal of truth to his analysis. I don't accept that there is no separate ethnicities. I think that's silly. Where I don't agree, I do think he's right about um, uh, the separate treatment. I also think he's correct that it's vital that they de-Arabize themselves given the Arab-Israel conflict. Where I think he's wrong um, and protests too much is his notion that Jews, have, the, uh, the uh, Mizrahi Jews, have had their identity robbed from them, they have inferiority complexes, they were completely dominated and so on. What he forgets is the, is the structure of Zionism, is that when the Eastern European Zionists came, the ideology was built upon a negation of their own past, and a radical transformation of their own identity. Anu banu arza livnotu lihibanotba. We came to Israel to build and to be rebuilt. So there is a, I mean, what is left for the, of East European traditional culture, Jewish culture? Obviously, we are with a terrible historical event, but uh, there was this total revolt against Yiddish, their own language. You weren't allowed to speak it. So I think I can understand the, the, the anger and I can understand, but, but I think that it also applies to what Zionism tried to do. Okay, uh, any other questions? Yes, one, okay. And then uh, that will be the last question. Um, I keep thinking at moments <coughs> about uh, what uh, John Efren uh, writes in his book on uh, medicine and the German Jews. He tells that uh, when Jews find access to uh, universities and privately educated uh, physicians can enter uh, university education uh, medicine, they begin to study together with their non-Jewish colleagues, the health of Jews and non-Jews. And they find some 
very uh, surprising facts that whether in Budapest or in London or in Amsterdam or in Frankfurt or in Russia or in the United States, Jews live 10 to 15 years longer than non-Jews when they live side by side. And they find that uh, child mortality among the Jewish population is half or sometimes one third of what it is among the non-Jewish population. That's in the course of the 19th century that they find this out. And it is a result of... Could you phrase the question? Yes. It's the result of what happens as a s sequence on the Enlightenment. But it happens in the same century that the opposition against the Jewish, non-Jewish cooperation arises in the academic world. And I think there's this dimension how different generations relate to each other. Can you just uh, quick phrase what, what your question is, please? Okay, I've said enough. Okay. Um, I, I know Efron's book, it's a very interesting book. Um, I'm just not sure how here I could reply, you know, I could engage the question of Oriental and, and Occidental, East and West. Um, but that maybe if, jo if, if David invites me to give a lecture on medicine and the Jews, then, uh, then that, we can that talk may about be it. <laughs> a good idea for next, uh, next mm -hmm. time. And uh, I think we should stop. Uh, um, uh, you can, as, as usual, usually go out and uh, have a drink and uh, further discuss this lecture. Uh, I would uh, just like to um, ask you to put in your agenda as the 12th of May, because at that date uh, the Manasseh Ben Israel Institute has two events. One is uh, the symposium on uh, current anti-Semitism, uh, on which you have a flyer on your chair, and the other is in the evening there will be the last lecture in this series on um, the golden age of Spain, which uh, Professor Asheim already referred to uh, by the uh, uh, very distinguished scholar, uh, Spinoza scholar also, Jeremiao Jovel. Good night and thank, thank you again. You.